put down the remote, set your phasers to stun, and pick up that paperback. You do have books in the 24th century. Welcome to Episode 3 of Reading Trek, a Star Trek Book Club podcast, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. My name is William Conlon, and I'm joined by my co-host, Marty Ali. Marty, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Will. How about you? I am fantastic. Today we are joined by our special guest. You know her from such shows as Shore Leave, Disco Trek, and The Edge. We welcome our very own discovery guru, Miss Heather Barker. Heather, it's such a pleasure to have you on as our first guest. I like that, discovery guru. That's a high <laughs> compliment. I hope that I live up to that across my various discovery <laughs> podcast appearances. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. And let me just take a moment to say how proud we are here at the Tricorder Transmissions um, of Reading Trek and of both of you. We were just ecstatic to hear that members of our STLV family wanted to join the podcast family and had this amazing idea. Um, your enthusiasm and professionalism has impressed us so much. And Ma- Mama Bear Heather here is just like so, so, so proud of you guys. Oh, thank so you. happy to be here. That's so sweet. Thanks yeah. so much. We're really excited to be here as well. All right. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a Star Trek book club podcast working through the expanded universe one novel at a time. Although we do encourage you to follow along with the reading, this podcast was designed as a way to give all fans a way to journey through the expanded universe together, even if you haven't read the books. If you're reading along with us, revisiting an old favorite, or if you just want to know more about the expanded universe, this is a podcast for all Star Trek fans. We have three main segments on Reading Trek. The first is Turn the Page, where we summarize the reading and give our first reactions. Next is Highlight the Text, where we dig a little deeper and talk about the characters, plot, writing, and how it all connects to canon. The last section depends on whether we've broken the book up. We'll either have Peek Ahead, where we'll give our theories on the rest of the story, or we'll have Shelve It, where we wrap up the novel and give our final thoughts and ratings. With that said, let's get to today's selection. That's the book. I know it's a book. The book. Today we will be discussing chapters 1 through 17 of Drastic Measures by Dayton Ward. Excellent. When and where in the Trek universe does this take place, Marty? The question isn't where we are. It's when we are. Drastic Measures takes place in 2246, 10 years before the battle at the Binary Stars, and 19 years before where no man has gone before, the TOS pilot, the original pilot, not the cage. Will, do you have any trivia for us today? Why, yes I do. Drastic Measures was first released in 2018, written by Dayton Ward, a seasoned Star Trek novelist. Ward's first Trek outing was published in the Star Trek Strange New Worlds fan writing contest anthology with a story called Reflections. In an article he wrote for StarTrek.com, Dayton describes writing Drastic Measures as, quote, the most challenging Star Trek writing project I ever tackled, to date at least, due to the fact that the show was in development throughout my writing and we were all sort of learning the ropes as we went along. End quote. With that, I will turn it over to you, Marty, for a recap. But first, we would like to remind you that from here on out, there will be spoilers for Drastic Measures and possibly Star Trek Discovery Season 1. Black Alert. Black Alert. Previously on Star Trek Discovery. The Federation colony on Tarsus IV is suffering a food crisis. Food supplies and the ability to create more are being ravaged by a fungal contamination unlike any the Federation has come across before. On the surface, Commander Gabriel Lorca is running down the hallway of the Starfleet outpost, chasing down intruders who have broken in, knocked out communications, and are trying to steal the food supply, despite Lorca already agreeing to supply the colony with the outpost food rations. The intruders fire on Lorca, their phasers set to kill, but Lorca is able to stun them first. He then runs into Ensign Terry Bridges and Lieutenant Asal Stolani, two members of his five-person outpost team, and they continue looking four intruders together. They stun two more intruders, but not before two members of his team are killed. Lorca and Bridges interrogate the intruders and find out that the men weren't just after food, but weapons as well, and he had made off with several crates of phaser rifles. They also find out that because of the current food shortage crisis, Governor Ribeiro has been removed from office and replaced by Adrian Kodos, who says he has experience with crisis situations. Kodos is also planning to address the entire population of the colony in two separate meetings, and Lorca feels he shouldn't miss it. 
Lorca, Bridges, and Sultani meet at the home of Lorca's girlfriend, Belana, who had already traveled to the amphitheater to hear the governor's speech. Lorca turned on the viewing screen to watch as Governor Kodos, hidden in the shadows, steps up to give a speech about survival and unconventional thinking. As the speech ends, Kodos sentences the 4,000 people in the amphitheater to their death as Lorca and his team watch in horror as phaser cannons start to vaporize everyone in the area, leaving no survivors. Two days later, the trio, with the help of a security officer they rescued from an angry mob, are able to penetrate the communications array and contact the USS Narboon to fill them in on what happens. On board the ship, Commander Filippo Giorgio is prepping the food rations as the colony's support vessel prepares to land on the surface of Tarsus IV. Once there, Giorgio and the captain of the Narboon meet with Governor Rubero, who's been reinstated after the disappearance of Kodo. During their meeting, a trusted member of the governor's staff comes in with a grenade. The grenade was deactivated but leaves the team to wonder who they can trust. Later, while investigating the site of the massacre, Lorca and Giorgio are met with an angry population who start throwing cocktail bombs at the pair. Giorgio's captain tries to calm the crowd with a Kirk-style speech, but the crowd is demanding justice. They are demanding Starfleet find Kodos. Later, Lorca hunts down one of Kodos' supporters and manages to stun him and bring him in, a step closer to finding Kodos. Meanwhile, Giorgio is assisting the security team in the city's comm center when they get an alert that seven explosions have hit various power distribution centers in the city. Sensing a trap to get at Kodos' supporters being held at the comm center, Giorgio heads off to face the intruders, and after stunning one of them, she is met with a barrage of phaser fire that sets off a nearby explosion of blue-white light. Nicely done, Marty. So uh, let's talk about our first reactions, standout characters, plots, writing moments. Uh, how about you, Heather? What did you think? So, so far, I, I really love it. And that, that may be just because I love just about everything about Discovery. Um, I read Desperate Hours when that came out, and that's a totally different book than this one, guys. So um, just be be prepared. Like, don't dismiss one for the other or anything like that. Um, this is very different. And the very unique aspect of Drastic Measures is that we're dealing with a Giorgio that we don't really know because we barely got to know her in Discovery, and and a prime Lorca. So while I was thinking about Lorca, I was like, the only Lorca that I know is Mirror Universe Lorca. I don't give a damn. So mm-hmm. when, I, when I read certain things about, um, like, Lorca being attracted to a, a character that we'll, we'll talk about later, I'm sure, his love interest um, yeah. in the book, and what attracted... Uh, him to her I was just like whoa this is totally different than in than in Discovery and duh it's because it's Prime Lorca um so I I think that what we've seen in the first 17 chapters fits in um with with what a Prime Lorca would be um he's he's pretty tame pretty tame and it it makes me kind of miss miss the the mirror Lorca a little I still don't give a damn and I think Georgiou is is about on the same page. We learned some background information about Georgiou that I didn't know previously. Um, but being that they're kind of the two main characters, I'm satisfied with what we've learned so far. And I thought it was interesting to get the perspective of Kodos here because we've never really had his perspective. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more. But I found that very intriguing and valuable as well. Absolutely. How about you, Marty? Uh, my first reactions, the notes that I wrote in the margins of my book are, um, I was I was impressed with the description of the Narboon. It's just a colony support vessel. It's one of those um, those ships we see all the time in like Next Generation where they land and they disassemble it and make their houses out of it. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's that ship. That's the ship it is. So I thought that was pretty cool. Reminded um, me a lot of um, the Mayweather family ship from Enterprise as well. As well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I found it interesting that they're keeping the Constitution class ships a secret because they're fearful about people 
backlashing against Starfleet for having warships. And I also, in relation to constitutions, I thought it was interesting that Georgiou was, is slated for the, for service on the Defiant, which as we know, gets thrown back in time and to a different universe. Yeah, it looks like she was destined for something bad no matter where she got assigned. Oh. Oh, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> too soon, too soon. <laughs> Um, and then my last little, <laughs> oh, Will, my last little note here is um, we, we got a, Den- a Denobulin at the hospital. Another yes. Another Enterprise tie-in. I actually, when I read that section, I started frantically looking through Memory Alpha, Memory Beta to see if there was any connection to uh, to Phlox, because I don't think I've heard of another Denobulin outside of Enterprise. No, just like we haven't heard of Kelpians outside of Discovery. How about you, Will? What are your, uh, your initial thoughts well i absolutely loved the fact that he started it kind of in the middle of the action i didn't know if we were gonna get kind of a ramp up from the beginning you know everything's okay on the planet and then suddenly the food crisis starts up to have it actually start with you know Lorca under fire and you know stuff is already going down i thought that was a really interesting move that's that's an interesting move for a novel to do because normally when you start in the middle of the action that's like a short story thing to do like short stories, you always have to start the action as late as possible. Yeah. It's not something you normally see in novels. So I, I also thought that was pretty interesting. And I thought, I, you know, I thought that that was reasonable too in the sense that we all have a base understanding of what is going to happen in some ways because we have the great TOS episode, Conscience of the King. So right. um, it didn't really make it necessary for him to give us all that backstory. Uh, I like that it kind of had a uh, almost true crime nature to it, the way that he kept going to those interviews that are so many years later with the with the people who committed the atrocities. Um, I believe the name of the the book that they keep referencing is called The Four Thousand. So you kind of got twenty third century true crime literature being in, injected into mm-hmm. it. And then uh, I just thought it was. Uh, it was a uh, very interesting. I'm looking at my notes here. It was it was very interesting for me because I kept kind of getting a an almost nine eleven connection to Kodos and going and hiding in a cave like Bin Laden. Yeah. And you have oh, an amphitheater yeah. like Ground Zero with people coming yeah. to visit it and remember what happened there. So that that hit pretty hard for me. Yeah, I definitely had that the same thoughts about the hiding in the caves for sure. I didn't. I, I tend not to. <laughs> dwell too much in those thoughts like that's generally what I do after I read like everything and then go back and revisit and see what I get from it but I had the same exact thought I actually didn't think of that until you mentioned it right now and yeah wow that's pretty 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 cool all right let's um move into highlight the text characters plot writing and all the spaces in between Heather what do you got for us so some of the things that I thought really, so they both set this Lorca apart from the Lorca we know, but then also connected him to what we know. As I mentioned earlier, talking about um, his love interest, Belena, it says he was attracted to her carefree nature, warmth of heart, and unrelentingly positive outlook on life. And to me, like yeah. the Lorca that we know, that's not what he's into. <laughs> That's not what he's going to do, yeah. But I'm like, oh, hey, that sounds a lot like me. Maybe Prime Lorca would like go on a date with me. Um, so I, I thought that that was, that was something that was really nice that sets him apart from Mirror Lorca that we know. Um, but then later on, I think uh, probably the next chapter, there's a reference to fortune cookies, mm-hmm. which I just Yes, I love that. I don't think any Star Trek fan is able to look at a fortune cookie now. At least any Star Trek fan who's watched Discovery can look at a fortune cookie without thinking about Captain Lorca, Mirror Universe or not. Um, I love that we have that tie in there as well. Um, Did anybody ever notice that we never saw a fortune out of those fortune cookies? Because I would imagine that that would have given something away. You open the fortune and it's like, I'm going to kill you. Oh, he's from the Mirror Universe. I joke that they were misfortune cookies. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, and like it's, it's, I wonder how many other Star Trek fans are doing this because I totally, with the Chinese New Year um, being not too long ago, I went and bought a giant thing of fortune cookies. Nice. 
And now you can cosplay as Lorca at STLV. Oh, it was bad. Don't, guys, don't do this. Don't go buy a giant bin of fortune cookies, especially when you're single, because you will eat all of them in like three days. <laughs> um, so don't do that. And they were all great fortunes, but still, um, bad, bad idea to do that. I thought it was really interesting that they, they point out, it's on page 101 when they're talking about um, what happened. And so, you know, essentially the, the planet that the, the people were on, sorry, I don't have the notes of what that planet's name was. I Tarsus feel, 4. Tarsus 4. You. So that, but that's the planet that we're on now, right? So it was the Epsilon Serona is oh, where yes. the refugees came from. So Riviero is, is talking about what happened and explaining that this was a decision made by someone else, implemented by someone else, and put into motion without even a passing attempt at respecting the sovereign status of this planet or her authority as its duly elected leader. So it, like, it feels like they didn't really even get a choice about these people coming. Like They knew that it really wasn't a question but they weren't even asked like it, it no one the federation didn't really consider how bringing these refugees to this planet would affect the population overall um so i like the fact that they that they pointed that out and it did it did make me think a little bit about our own political environment here in the united states yeah I found myself thinking about this throughout these first 17 chapters. And so that's something I'll talk about later on when we talk about what's coming with, you know, in the, the rest of the book. But, um, you know, illegal immigration. And this isn't illegal Im immigration. This is relocation. But I, I right. kind of wonder if there's an underlying dialogue here, a message here. There was something that I pulled out on page 53, a quote, right before Kodo starts his speech. Everything for which we've worked is threatened. The short-sightedness of a few has threatened us all. If we do not act, it will all disappear, yanked from us as a consequence of rash action, and also as punishment for crimes perpetrated not by us, but rather against us. Which totally just, like, reign true of our current political climate for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was a very short-sighted look for people who are members of the Federation because, you know, isn't isn't kind of the core theme, you know, looking out for each other and helping each other. And you're talking about an entire planet that currently has 4,000 people on it. It seems like another 4,000 isn't a make-or-break situation, especially since was, they established... It was 6,000. They brought 6,000 people over. Excuse me, 6,000. But, it, I mean, they say in there that the Federation also provides additional resources, the infrastructure necessary. So it's not like they were just, you know utilizing the resources and then moving on they got a lot of backup along with it so i felt like it was a very non-federation response to something that's kind of a core tenant of what people in that future you know live by which is really interesting to see you know this behavior from the federation again like or a precursor yeah. really to what we wind up seeing in discovery exactly and I think that just goes to show that, you know, this this federation is still really finding itself and, and that that plays into Discovery's story overall. So I really hope that everybody reads these books. That's all I have to say. They're really good. If you look at what happened in Enterprise with Captain Archer, he was, you know, he wouldn't even he didn't even have like a prime directive set up until almost the end of the series. Yep. You know, so they're even a hundred years later, still trying to figure out what all this means. And to give context to, to where the Federation is at this point, I believe one of the things they mention in there is that uh, Beta Z has just been given entry into the Federation. Yep. So, you know, the whole, you know, grouping of Federation planets that we know from the kind of 1990 to 2005 Star Trek universe, you know, we don't even have all of those players in place yet. Right, right. Heather, anything else for the characters' plots writing? Um, just little things here and there. I mentioned um, getting the perspective of Kodos before, and one of the things we've seen so far in these 17 chapters is is evidence that he feels remorse for what he did. Yes. And that's not something that I gained from Conscience of the King. So I I just really love this deep dive. I, I'm really I'm really thrilled that 
that that episode and this story is what um, was chosen to be in this book because I'm I'm fascinated. Um, and again, I think that this is just such a multifaceted story. There's just so much to learn. Um, we also learned that Giorgio was trained as a field medic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I thought was fascinating because, you know, we only got two episodes with her. So <laughs> again, that's something that, that we didn't know. So that was, that was pretty cool to learn. If she knew that, why couldn't she have helped Ensign Connor on the bridge? Oh, man. Man. Again, Will, too soon. Too soon. (laughs) So I was going to mention this technology that I had not seen before. So it's on page 159. I'm just going to read it. Reaching into one of the pouches on his equipment belt, Lorca extracted a magnetic lock override device and placed it over the keypad set into the wall next to the residence, residence's rear door. Known as a P-38 or skeleton key in Starfleet parlance, the tool was normally used by engineers and security personnel aboard starships as a means of bypassing the locking mechanisms of a starship's interior and exterior pressure hatches. Can we just call it a sonic screwdriver? Sonic screwdriver. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the equivalent of computer security override, wharf, pi, gamma, 35, alpha. I don't, I don't remember like ever seeing anything like that before. Um, so much like lots of the technology on Discovery, like the breath print that we saw once. <laughs> I forgot all about that. Yeah, I just, I thought that was really neat. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll put that in the black batch file. Well, hey, at least we know what the skeleton key does. I don't. I, I really wanted to post after the discovery finale i was just gonna write we finally found out what the black badges were ha 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 because we did <laughs> just tweet a picture of the black badges and tag like aaron harbert and um ted sullivan and don't say anything just tweet that picture i will leave that to our friend uh, bill smith of Trek geeks because he, <laughs> i think he did mention it last night like that was like the first thing he tweeted after the or Sunday night after the finale. But anyway, anyway, so yeah, I really kind of just latched on to Giorgio and Lorca here and Kodos. I'm surprised that we latched on to Kodos, actually. He's really intriguing in this book. Mm -hmm. He is. And I mean, because we don't, you know, we had like a one dimensional (laughs) character from TOS. So we really just didn't know a whole lot about him. Um, And and I'm I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated that he feels remorse for what he did because that's a lot. That's genocide. I mean, genocide. He knows what he did and he knows the consequences of it, too. He knows he's going to go to a penal colony because he mentions it on, on 117. He had no intention of spending the rest of his days consigned to a penal colony or worse, a psychiatric facility such as the remote planet of Elba 2, an asylum for the criminally insane and other miscreants viewed as unsuited for existence in the idealistic paradise the Federation has labored to create. Oh, man. I thought that was a really cool like passage there. Absolutely. And something, I mean, obviously not in the justification of, say, mass murder, but just think about, like, something you may have done a long time ago that you were questioning at the time, but now in your head you've... Um, kind of given yourself the excuses for why you may have done it. Not not even saying if it's a bad thing, but I, I think that's where he is in the episode, in the TOS episode, that he's justified it all in his mind and he's unrelenting. So yeah, it is a, an interesting uh, psychological dive to hear him, you know, having so much doubt within the moment of it. Kodos made a decision of life and death. Some had to die that others might live. But you're a man of decision, Captain. You ought to understand that. All I understand is that 4,000 people were needlessly butchered. In order to save 4,000 others. And if the supply ships hadn't come earlier than expected, this Cortis of yours might have gone down in history as a great hero. But he didn't. Yeah. It's fascinating. So I'm, I'm captivated. Totally. And I love there's one line, too, uh, where they say that um, he was prepping his speech like he was getting ready for a theatrical performance. <laughs> Not surprised at all. And I have to point out that in his speech, 
where he says the revolution is successful, but survival depends on drastic measures. Mm -hmm. So, hey, yes. hey. Well, that's that's actually um, taken directly from TOS, like that part of the speech. The revolution is successful, but survival depends on drastic measures. Your continued existence represents a threat to the well-being of society. Your lives mean slow death the more valued members of the colony. Therefore, I have no alternative but to sentence you to death. Your execution is so ordered, signed Kodos, governor of Tarsus IV. I watched Conscience, um, what is it, Conscience of the King? Right before I started taking my notes, and I saw that, and I actually screenshotted it and sent it to Dayton Ward, and I was just like, you crafty dog. <laughs> And he gave us a little Picard uh, animated response. Oh, was it like Picard dancing? Yeah. It was Picard giggling. It was really cute. Will, what do you, uh, what do you got? Well, yeah. Uh, so similar to what uh, you guys were saying, I, um, I I really like that this is our first true look at Prime Lorca. And I I really like Prime Lorca. That's why I'm you know, definitely in the camp of hoping that he's somewhere out there and will make an appearance later on, on TV. Uh, I... I love Philippa and seeing that she's kind of still developing, you know, who she is and who she's going to be as a captain. There's that moment where she goes to um, the uh, captain's quarters on the Norban and she sees that he's got like books and trinkets up behind his desk and she admires that. So I like that that kind of ties it back to what her office and the, uh, yeah. what her ready room on the Shenzhou looks like. Yep. Uh, she actually says one line um, I wrote down. He seemed to share her preference for the look and feel of a physical book to its electronic counterpart. I liked that. I feel them with that one. I love physical books. Me too. And then uh, there was one note that I put in here. Um, during that scene in the hospital, we have the little girl with the torn Andorian doll. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there's a little foreshadowing there that that's going to be uh, Lenore Caridian. <gasps> Oh my, I didn't Ooh. even think about that. My wow, that's really cool. Love it. Now I'm excited. Now I'm like, I have to go read tonight. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> if, you, if you look at the um, timeline, then Lenore would probably be about 10 years old at this point. So she's got to be somewhere around there. Yeah. Wow. I, I didn't even think of, like, I figured there was significance because they're spending time there. But I didn't even, I don't, man, now I feel like a bad Star Trek fan, man. And then the one other note that I had on here regarding characters is I thought it was interesting that um, Admiral Anderson is is so prominent this far back because we have him as a character in Battle of the Binary Stars. We yep. have him in Desperate Hours and here we are yep. eight years before Desperate Hours and he's still the one who's calling the shots. I mean, is there another Admiral in Starfleet for this entire time period? Is that who Admiral Anderson is? Yeah. I just thought it was some random Admiral. Brett Anderson. I mean, the guy, he must be like a 25-year-old Admiral at this point. I don't even think I learned his name. The guy that is not Anthony Michael Hall. It's his name, what, Terry Serpico, I believe. Yeah. Uh -huh. And y'all, like, Google Terry Serpico, you, uh, Postal Service sitcom. Because there, he's, I'm sorry, this is a total tangent, but I learned it on John Oliver. There is a sitcom with him in it, and it's about, like, the Postal Service. Is that him? I like, remember when John yeah. Oliver did that. Yes, that's him. That's him. It's hilarious. And a total side note, sorry. We're the United but... States Postal Service. Yeah, it's, it's oh my <laughs> gosh, it's so funny. But I'm like, yes, it's that guy. Because the, the night that we met him on Discovery, I think my, my trucky BFF Claire was like, it's not Anthony Michael Hall. It's a different guy. And it's just, they look very similar. And so that's who he is. Terry Serpico, yes. not Anthony Michael Hall. Okay, sorry. Nice. Well, for me, um, I again felt that Kodos was the most intriguing character in the book. I just love the insight, like getting into his head for a couple chapters, even though I didn't put it in the recap. But um, it's just fascinating to see like how he keeps going like back and forth on if he made the right decision or not. And then um, there was the thing that I mentioned earlier about the Federation sending people who don't fit their ideals to that psychiatric facility and it makes me wonder if that's 
like some place that they just send people to and never acknowledge them again? Or is it like a rehabilitation center? Like, you know, that's kind of scary that that if you are viewed as having like some sort of mental disorder or something that doesn't, that can't be cured, you know, that you'll get sent to this place just to live out the rest of your days. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about the, and I feel so bad because I don't remember the character, but when, um, when Lethe came out that episode, there's, there's an original series episode with that character that they were comparing Cornwell to the character that was Lethe, and I don't remember the name yes. of that episode, but she was she was a psychologist who had apparently gone insane. Again, I'm damaging my my Trek cred here for not knowing the episode that that was in. That is, thank you, Memory Alpha. That is episode Dagger of the Mind. Right, Dagger of the Mind. So was she? Did she go to an insane asylum? I just remember that she was. They were saying like she was essentially insane or mentally ill or something. A colony for rehabilitative therapy. Interesting. Interesting. So it all kind of ties back to the same kind of thing. That's wow. That's really, that's really cool. I wonder if we'll see more of this. Put, put a bookmark in it. (laughs) That's your new catchphrase, guys. Put a bookmark in it. Put a bookmark in it. Absolutely, because I feel like um, given the proximity to these books and canon, I mean, they're essentially regarding these books as canon. I think there's a lot of foreshadowing on things that we're going to see maybe in season two and beyond. Uh, We were just saying in our last um, uh, supplemental mini episode that um, the whole uh, Michael Burnham losing her parents was actually given in stark detail in Desperate Hours and not actually discussed on this show until – the season finale so we had foreshadowing there yeah and you know i just have to side note here because it was I, i'm watching with a friend um and he had to take a bathroom break and he's like just keep watching it's okay and so i'm watching and that that was the part and i was like okay it's the backstory and then he came back and i'm like you didn't miss anything she just talked about how her parents died which we already knew yeah and then i realized later <laughs> like i only knew that because i read the book he didn't read the book so he didn't yeah. know. <laughs> so I was like, oh, oh my God. I totally, I didn't even piece that together until someone mentioned it on Twitter. And I was just like, holy cow. That, I mean, that's some good craftsmanship there. That like that, that stuck with me yeah. enough that, that I read it and then I watched it and I didn't even realize it was two different mediums. Yeah, this is the tightest knit we've ever had a writer's room with expanded universe novelists and i love it well and i know dayton ward is is known for kind of crafting like different elements of different episodes into his novels too so speaking of the dayton ward's writing um i know that the starfleet corps of engineers um came from dayton's previous series of the same name but i have no idea what that is because i haven't read them yet oh no me neither me neither hey dayton you're gonna have to tell us about that sorry dayton we promise we'll read them that's why this exists yeah um i love the part in the book where they are talking about an over-reliance on technology and i might have just pulled this off because i um for school just read um forester's the machine stops which is um, a short story about uh, our over-reliance on technology. Um, let's see, page 96. How could something like this happen in this day and age where technology has solved nearly every problem that plagued humanity before in its discovery of faster-than-light travel and other inhabited worlds? It was a sudden, brutal slap across the face, a grim reminder that complacency and over-reliance on technology were fraught with risk and that was before someone decided to introduce other elements into the mix Mm -hmm. just another kind of like dig at our own current like social habits 
truly. I mean, these books, these books are not just light fare. They are addressing the issues of today, which I think they're, is... They're getting really serious, which is classic Star Trek. That's what they do. Oh, man. Um, yeah, but I mean, I agree with Heather on everything that she said about Georgiou and Lorca and Kodos. And my only other note that I have in here is that I'm sad that when the Narboon landed, we didn't get a blue alert like we did in Voyager. Code blue. Commander Tubok to all hands. Go to blue alert and report to code blue stations. <laughs> There's so many colors out there. We've got to figure out uh, what some of the other ones are. What's the protocol for like a magenta alert? <laughs> that doesn't sound pleasant. This week's episode of Star Trek is uh, guest starring RuPaul, magenta alert. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm overly like cautious about laughing now because I noticed on a lot of podcasts that like once people like if they let out really big like belly laughs you know the sound isn't quite balanced and then i'm like oh my ears so i mean that was a genuine belly laugh but i'm like oh my gosh i just pierced someone's ear so sorry that's okay i'm well, i'm sure we're all guilty of that dre dre lax is the denobulan jolly dre d-r-a-l-a-x dre lax was how they pronounced it in the audiobook okay see that's that i have to say is a benefit of the audiobook is pronunciation because I'm a reader and I am almost 37 years years old and I still say words wrong because I just I only read them and never never have really used them in dialogue or whatnot so that is that is good well if anybody ever tries to make you feel bad just understand they're putting up a big facade <laughs> You know what's funny related to that is that I went to like four different elementary schools growing up and they were always at like a different level in their like language arts classes. So I never really learned how to spell words properly. So like going like being an English major in school now, I like everybody's just like, you're an English major. How do you not know how to spell? And I was just like, blame my elementary education. It happens. All right. Yeah. So I randomly opened up a page and I'm on the page where we meet the little girl. And so in the, in here it says her name is Shannon Moulton. So I wonder, and then her mother is Eliana Moulton. So I wonder like, maybe we'll find out that that's like an alias. But she's yeah. Cause she says that her mother is a geologist, right? Yeah. And that's what Kodos is. Kodos was a geologist studying the rock formations of the planet. She says, I'm an advisor. Specifically, I'm an agricultural scientist. I work with other scientists to better understand the planet's ability to be farmed for both indigenous and imported seeds and crops. So, I mean, I think there's enough here that that could potentially be what happens. Yeah, absolutely. That was my first thought when that whole thing came up because everything happens in for a reason in a book. So, you know, we're not just having some random scene with a little girl come in. She's she's going to play later, I'm sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just I just I just randomly open it up here, so I'm like, wow. okay, nice. And also, let me just say that considering that Discovery works with a spore drive and mushrooms and fungus, can I just say it's kind of intriguing that this whole planet issue is a fungal issue yeah that is really fascinating yeah maybe very young mirror stamets is off somewhere messing with them from another universe yeah. does not mean that everything is related in that way i just thought hmm, fungus and fungus interesting well to just talk about relations and how things are related for a minute um i i think it's something to look at these books you know these de discovery books desperate hours and drastic measures because it kind of reinforces star trek's overall idea of destiny that you have you know, all these iconic characters kind of converge and overlap each other at some point because space is kind of big. And yet yeah. within the same 30 year period, all these faces do interact with each other a few times. That's true. That's true. Okay, so let's move into canon connection. You think it's all connected somehow? So Heather, what other than the obvious conscience of the king, did you find any other um, 
connections to known canon or what are your thoughts on canon since you mentioned that earlier i i hate canon <laughs> so i i'm i'm not a canonista as the word has been coined by whomever coined it to begin with um i don't it drives me nuts because it's a, an extremely divisive subject and I don't need everything to fit into a perfect little box to, to make it Star Trek or good Star Trek. Um, it's just not something that I think about. When I think about what is Star Trek, um, it's more about, you know, the ideals of the Federation. It's about, you know, what defines our humanity. It's about optimism. Right. It's about exploration. It's about communication, compassion, treating others as we would treat ourselves. And so at the end of the day, that's what I look for when, when I ask the question, is this Star Trek? Not, does this look like a D23? Um, and it, not to discredit those who do, you know, every, every fan has their opinion and, you know, we all have opinions and no one's opinion is wrong. Just for me, it's, it's not essential to what I enjoy as Star Trek mm -hmm. at, at, at STLV last year when we had Kristen Beyer, it was Kirsten Beyer, um, what Ted Sullivan and Akiva Goldsman were up on stage together. And I think, that's when the, the novels got brought up, um, being that that's what Kirsten is known for. And during that discussion, I walked away understanding that the, no these, the Discovery novels were actually going to be considered canon. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing because the books have never, never been considered canon. Right. And then afterwards... <laughs> Like when Desperate Hours came out, I asked um, David Mack on Twitter if the book was canon because given that I do a Discovery podcast and when I do like my podcasting for me is like a job. I don't get paid, but um, I, I do it with passion and I want to be professional about it. So when I talk about a book or information from a book, I just want to make sure that what I'm saying is is correct and accurate. And David said that, no, they're not canon, but it's like, it's canon until it's not. Right. It's like, I think it's really, really neat to have all these things tied in together. And I would have, I just, I like that it's, it can be a complete story. Like you can go back and, and read Desperate Hours or you can read um, Drastic Measures and, and that can all, all be the same story. Um, and in my mind, it sort of kind of is, but it also, it doesn't have to be. So it's just, it's not a big deal to me. It's not something that I look for. Um, I'm reading this book sort of like it could be part of the story, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and, and so far, um, I don't, I didn't really find, I didn't make a note. Like that's how, that's how disassociated I am from canon. Like I didn't go through and make notes on stuff like that. My notes were stuff like the fortune cookies, which yeah. I thought was a really neat, you know, a, a neat tie-in. Like I like, I like the tie-ins, but I don't need it to be picture perfect. And I completely 100% agree with you on that. I don't. I don't care about like things looking differently or going differently on anything. Um, but as far as like for purposes of this podcast, I think what we mean by canon connections, just just so everybody out there understands, um, we're not really looking for things to match up perfectly with with the shows um, or like anything like that. What what we're what we're trying to do here is just to see like. What what aspects of the the Star Trek universe um, influence this book? Like, what elements of the universe can we find in in the text? And um, it doesn't have to match up perfectly. It could be like you know, someone walks by with trill spots, and then it's just like, oh, that's from you know Deep Space Nine. Now, how cool, you know? Right. So things yeah. like the Denobulan or Baby yeah, exactly. Zed being mentioned, stuff like that, which. It's definitely in here. Um, and are things that I like that that's 
fun, right? It's all just fun stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're looking for. The, the where I am hoping, and obviously it, it won't break my heart, it won't destroy my desire to read these fantastic books, but where I'm hoping is that given the dedication that they have to make this as close to canon as possible, I hope that, for example, when the new season of Discovery comes back and we have, you know, the USS Enterprise bearing down on Discovery right there, I really hope uh, Captain Pike doesn't get on the screen and say, it's nice to meet you, Specialist Burnham, because they met two years earlier battling the long-deceased Terranian Empire. Saru has a relationship already with Commander Una. We look, we know that he's got the hots for her even. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, but I mean, technically, according to, you know, Akiva and Ted and Kirsten, like the books are not canon. No. And I'm sure like in their future writing, these, these stories are going to get overridden by something that they put on the show. So, I mean, that happens all over the, the novel universe. Yeah. It does. And I think like if, if these novels were restricted by canon, I don't think we'd have the plethora of, of reading material that we do. No, um, no, we would not. And and this goes for, you know, any universe. And I know a lot of people talk about like comic books and, and how comic books work. Comic books are a mess though, because the, anytime they want to redo something, they just create another multiverse. Yeah. Or look at, say, Star Wars and, and the 30 years worth of books that were sold as canon and then thrown out when Disney purchased. So there was a lot oh, yeah. of controversy there. Disney bought there. them, rebooted, rebooted the novels, and called all the old novels the Legends series now. Exactly. So. Yeah, I, you know, for me, look, and this is, I, I get on a rant um, anytime. I like your rants. <laughs> anytime that somebody mentions Roddenberry's vision, um, or are those fans that look toward Gene Roddenberry as the the god of Star Trek? And it's it's frustrating. I admire how much those people admire and look up to Gene Roddenberry. But I I encourage everyone, like if you have not read a biography of Gene Roddenberry, if you've not read um, what the continuing voyages by Mark Cushman. That's what those are called, right? It's been a while since I've read them. Um, anything that, that talks about what happened behind the scenes, um, any of the documentaries like Trek nation, which Rod Roddenberry did. And he talks about his relationship with his father. Like Gene Roddenberry was a human being just like you and me. Gene Roddenberry was not a perfect person. Mm-hmm. It's debatable whether or not he was a good person. In today's atmosphere and the Me Too movement, he'd probably be fired from his job. Regardless. Of oh, that, yeah. Like, regardless of that, what he did have was a very beautiful vision of the future. And and that is that is what sticks to us because that's what we want. We want to believe in. We want to believe that it gets better for us. And so I think that as fans a lot of us begin to feel, you know, we're, we're passionate about it. We connect with it. And then we start to feel an ownership about Star Trek. And I think that's where it starts to get sticky because, you know, Gene Roddenberry's dead. He's been dead for a while now and he'd been uninvolved with Star Trek for a while. Mm -hmm. um, most, we have more Star Trek now than, than that, that wasn't in like, wasn't, done under his hand than we do of what he did have an influence on. And we got some really great Star Trek that Roddenberry wasn't involved in. Oh, the yeah. reality is that it's not so much, you know, Roddenberry's vision anymore. Um, in my opinion, it's just, it's Star Trek's vision. And if you want to have ownership about something, just have it be about the future of Star Trek and what that means. And, Yep. Star Trek has been influenced by everyone who has touched it. And this is like what thousands of people at this point between the various iterations of Star Trek, whether it's, you know, television or novels, anyone who has worked on Star Trek has had an influence in what Star Trek has become. Star Trek survives because it's able to evolve with the times. And, you know, the great thing is that, yes, there's this, there's this, utopian vision which I, I you know utopia is a thing that i don't think we're ever going to see just to be honest um 
but I think that above above everything, the the true value of what we get from that aspiration is is the how we get there and how Star Trek teaches us to do that by having compassion, by communicating, by helping others, um, by being considerate, by fighting for our ideals. That is what Star Trek is to me. And so it's it's frustrating that people get caught up in like one man's vision or Roddenberry would have done it this way because <laughs> Roddenberry's not your best friend. He's mm-hmm. dead. <laughs> He's not here. You don't get to speak for what Roddenberry would do. Like, this is Star Trek. This is Star Trek now. And so, like, just go with the flow, guys. Like, it's it's okay to not like Discovery. Um, it, it's okay that it's it's different and it's hard to to accept things that are different at some point. But I just getting caught up in in things like canon. I just. It's really tough for me. I think that we just need to to realize that for Star Trek to survive, it has to continue to evolve. Well put. Well said. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, no. That's why we wanted you on here, because you have, you have one of the clearest um, visions of, you know, what a fan should be like, you know, uh, just echoing, you know, everything that you're saying there. It's just, I, I agree 100%. And, and it's funny because we hear that at STLV, we hear them talk about Roddenberry's vision. Well, okay, but there's, there have been so many showrunners and so many script writers and even the original series. I know DC Fontana and Richard Matheson and all those great writers, Harlan Ellison. I mean, it wasn't just, it was never about one man. Oh, I think that, you know, the, the basic idea <laughs> Of, of course, you know, it was this, this came from Roddenberry's mind, Roddenberry's heart, however you want to put it. Um, and it also came with the intention of making a lot of money. And and that's yeah. something that people just don't seem to understand. And I, you know, it's again, go educate yourself. Like, uh, I don't know, to me, like, I, I didn't, I haven't always been a Star Trek fan. And we're totally going off topic here. So I apologize. Um you know, I grew up in in a family that that enjoyed pop culture, but Star Trek wasn't part of that pop culture. Star Trek was for nerds. Hmm. And so I started on my own, like turning into a little sci-fi kid and watching all this science fiction. And then I I watched some Star Trek and I watched I watched some TNG, but I specifically remember watching Voyager. And I, I think it was just a really bad episode of Voyager. And it was like all of the dialogue, everything just seemed too too scripted. Like there was just something that wasn't organic about it and I didn't like it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to watch Star Trek. It really wasn't until I met my ex-husband who grew up in a Star Trek family. We watched Enterprise when it aired. And to be honest, Enterprise is not the best first Star Trek, especially for a woman. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That so man centric show. Yeah, like I I watched it and I was like, oh, okay, and then I lost interest. Um, mm-hmm. And then and then the 2009 Kelvin Universe film came out and I loved it. And that from that point, I watched all of every series except the animated series at that point. But I watched all of Star Trek, the entire history of Star Trek. I went to my first Vegas convention. And now, like, I will tell you, I will tell you all the time that Star Trek has changed my life. Um, Star Trek has saved my life. Star Trek, even now, like, and I'll watch out for Disco Trek. It'll probably be the the retrospective episode we do. But um, here I am again going through a really tumultuous transitional time in my life. And the thing that's keeping me going, like, a huge part of it is Star Trek. I am extremely passionate about it and I try to be extremely positive about it um, because there's just so much good that comes, that comes from Star Trek and the people. And I mean, the fans, like that's, that's a big part of why I love Star Trek now. Um, I don't go to the convention to see the guests. I go to see my friends. And yeah. Nice. It's, I mean, last year I went to see the guests, but this year I'm going to see my friends. Yeah, and that's what happens. You know, my first first year, I went to see the guests. And, like, this year, I'm really excited to see the Discovery cast. So, 
I'm definitely this year, like going to try to do photo ops and stuff like that. But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm there for the people. And you know what, as divisive as we can be online, like when we're there together, that stuff doesn't really happen. Yeah. Um, I don't see fights at the bar over how the, you know, JJ universe sucks or something like that. I just, there's, there's so much that is positive and unifying about Star Trek and that very basic belief that we will get to a better place someday and that we, we Star Trek fans, you know, we're, we're the ones setting the example to get us there. And like that, that is where my passion comes from. And I just don't see the point and being petty about stuff like canon <laughs> um, or, or just, not being the type of fan who like really learns about the history of Star Trek. Like I don't just watch Star Trek. Like I've read, and this, this happens with a lot of fans where they, they start off watching the shows and then they kind of get to the point where they start reading what happened behind the scenes. What's the history of the development of Star Trek. And when you do that, you learn things like the Idic was developed to, to sell Idic medallions and make yep. Runberry money. <laughs> Back to that yep. point. Um, I'm actually really looking forward. Um, have you seen the documentary show, The Toys That Made Us on Netflix? I've seen one episode of it with our good buddy, John Tenuto. They are um, currently working on a Star Trek episode for the Star Trek toys. So I'm, I'm really, really curious to see like how they pull that out because it was like, Partly, like, they wanted to sell merchandise, so. Mm -hmm. I feel really bad for getting us so off topic here. Um, But, yes, you know, Star Trek, it came from Ronberry. It exists because of so many other people who have influenced it over time. Star Trek was made to make money, but the the best part of Star Trek is that the ideals and philosophy um, that, that Roddenberry brought us and that everyone added to over all these years, over 51 years, has led to this legacy that we are now a part of. I just, it, there's so much good here. Like, why can't we all just be happy that we have more Star Trek? More Star Trek means means more Star Trek in the future, even. Yep. So yep. I'm excited, and this book is really great, so let's talk about it some more. <laughs> Well, that's a perfect transition to our favorite quotes, I think. Indeed, yeah. So, Marty, what are your favorite quotes? You know, I I pulled... I've already said a couple of them that were standouts to me. I was hoping you wouldn't say that, because I pulled... I've already read my two. Oh, my God. Did we all do this? I think we all read our quotes. I have one left, actually, that I haven't read yet. Savior of the Bridge. <laughs> It's a moment with Lorca when he is reflecting on, um, I keep wanting to call her Balana, but it's, it's Elena, I think Belena. Yeah. Um, so it's on, it's on page 141, closing his eyes for a moment. He pushed the image of her face from the forefront of his mind, banishing it to some dark corner of his thoughts. She deserved more of his mourning than he could afford just now. Tugged in my heartstrings a little bit. Yeah, wow. Which which are going to be my favorite quotes. It makes you think if uh, Admiral Cornwell is thinking the same thing about him now. Oh, oh yeah. 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 I think it, it says a lot about who Prime Lorca is, and I'm secretly hoping that we get to see him someday. <laughs> so I hope so. Oh, I do have one more. Hooray. I do too. Okay. You go first, Heather. All right. I don't think I already said this. So mine was a Lorca quote, and it's page 147. He said, Utopia is easy when everything works and all your basic needs are met. We tend to think we've traveled this long path towards peace and prosperity, but take away the necessities of living, and it's a short walk back to our baser instincts. Kodo's mistake was allowing that to cloud his judgment. And I I love this quote, and it kind of kind of ties into what I was just saying about this this idea of utopia and how realistic it really is um yep. because it's 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 just so easy i mean we're all human and there's you know conflict is a part of who we are 
And I think that, I think it's achievable that we could have peace someday, whether or not we excel past having money. I don't know about that, but um, I think that it just goes to show how easy it is to slip back um, into, into those baser instincts, basically. Um, so that, that was the quote that I picked out. That was the exact same quote that I was going to read. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah. Proximity alert. Nice. Will, did you have any other, um, any other quotes or anything else you wanted to talk about before we move into read ahead? You know, I think that's about it. I already read all my quotes. The only other thing that I actually had in quotation marks here is just that, you know, again, what I was saying earlier, that Kodos was prepping for a speech, like getting ready for a performance. I also liked that when um, he was in the, the amphitheater, Lorca observed on the TV, and he basically said that the whole thing that have, about him standing in the shadows made it look like he had a thing for theatrics. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of foreshadowing to the uh, actual TOS episode. I yeah. like that. Good stuff. Canon course. connections. There it is. There, <laughs> there we is. go. So, Marty, um, this is our first time that we are splitting a book in half. So I'm going to have you inaugurate. This is our first Read Ahead segment. Yeah, you're going to inaugurate Read Ahead. All right. I think what I hope we get from it is that we get Kirk and Layton and Riley, who were all targeted in that original series episode. I hope we get to see them. I think that Lorca's going to have to confront his grief at some point, and I hope... I honestly, like, I hope it makes me cry. Like, that's what I'm hoping for that moment. And I also think that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Yeah. Heather, how about you? Man, that's a lot better than anything I would ever say. So here's the thing. Now that I've done almost 15 episodes of Disco Trek, talking about Star Trek Discovery and talking about all the fan theories and what's going to happen, I have taken a giant step away from trying to, to think about how things are going to end and how things are going to play out. But I mean, it is exhausting when you're watching those episodes, isn't it? It is. It is. And I'm like, man, I kind of, it's like week to week, what you start to say sometimes becomes redundant. Like we were talking about a, Section 31 a lot in the beginning. And who's to say Section 31 may not, you know, may come in Season 2 or who knows? They might just write it in because so many people were talking about it. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but that, you know, we stopped talking about that, I think, by episode four or five. Yeah. So <laughs> I I will tell you this. I I am really enjoying getting to know this Lorca and this Shoujo and Kodos. And so I am just mostly excited to learn more about them and to see what happens and how this story plays out. I love um, the possibility of the little girl being the daughter. Um, mm, yeah. I think that's a great insight. Spoiler, sorry guys, that was, oh, you, we warned you. Black alert, black alert. Yeah, I, I'm i just along for the ride and guys, we have a heck of a lot of reading to do. Oh yeah. <laughs> we do. <laughs> So I will I will be sure to um, highlight some more quotes so that we have lots of quotes for next time. The quotes are my favorite part, I think. Oh well, if y'all listen to Disco Trek, you know I like to read the quotes. Yes. So it's uh, it's something that I love. It's just uh, we've the great thing about both Discovery the show and these books is that we have some great writers involved. We really do. I uh, you know there's a lot of books that I pick up and I can you know read a chapter or two and i'm just not drawn into and i picked this up and i couldn't put it down and i didn't want to put it down but i didn't want to read anymore because i didn't want to spoil myself you know so uh i think uh after we end tonight i might have to go read a chapter or two i think i might as well all three of us <laughs> all right well what do you what do you got for well i think the same 
same as what you were saying, I've got in my notes here, yeah, we have yet to see Kirk, Riley, or Leighton, so I'm hoping we see them all in there. I would, yeah, I'd love to see Kirk have to deal with the emotion of that. I think that would be an incredibly strong thing. Um, I'm curious to see if we're going to get more discussion of eugenics, maybe even tie it around to uh, the con history, because um, it's established in, in TOS that uh, Kodos was a strong believer in eugenics, so he may try to bring some Nunyan Singh uh, wisdom into his uh, reasoning. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see where it goes because, you know, the clock is ticking and we left, I mean, Marty, you could not have picked a better cliffhanger than a flash of blinding light on Philippa. So I'm really curious to see where she winds up after this. Yeah, me too. I'm really curious. All right, now let's go, uh, let's hear from some fellow readers who would like to share their thoughts Last week, we asked you which character pairing in David Mack's Desperate Hours was your favorite. Out of 56 votes, Burnham and Spock took the lead with 39% of the votes. Saru and Una were a close second with 38% of the votes. Pike and George U came in at 20%, and the Dr. Dentist had 3%. Oh, I'm glad that Dr. Dentist at least got one vote. Yeah. I'm team Saru and Una. Yeah, that's George. that's where I was too. That's a, that was a really close vote. They were tied at the at the end of it there. Yeah, that's why, that's why I'm hoping that they can look at Desperate Hours as canon because I would love to see an on-screen reunion between Una and Saru in season 2 of Discovery. Oh man. I just I wish that it could be Majel. <laughs> like, oh. That's just oh man, I wish I wish. I'm glad that we're getting to see the character again. But I just, I adore, I adore Majel for everything that, that she was. And <laughs> Okay. Heather, I'm curious. I already asked Will this question, but how would you feel about them doing a, a like Star Wars style, like CGI characters of the people we already know? I hate it. No. Okay. I, I heard something today about Leonard Nimoy and anyone who knows me knows how much I love Leonard Nimoy and I don't want to see him brought back in, in a show yeah. at all. Um, I thought the same thing. Yeah. yeah, it's it's tough. and uh, It's a slippery I, slope. It, it really is. And I, I think that I would just rather see these people recast. Like, I love the nods in, like, Star Trek Beyond. Um, I loved when they, you know, when Spock Prime dies. He opens um, Spock's things and everything, and they have the, the cast picture. Like, I liked that, but... If we're going to see any of these characters again, I'd just rather see them recast. Yeah. I was surprised to see the Enterprise in um, Desperate Hours. And I was like, whoa, whoa, we're going there? What's going to happen? But I liked it. Like, it was fine. It was exciting, yeah. It was, like, I like, and and again, like, those connections, like, Saru and Una really worked for me. Um, And then spoilers like with the discovery and where discovery is going to go i mean who knows but if we're going to see those characters then absolutely just go ahead and recast them and i think we kind of have a precedent sent that they will be recast because if the ship had flown up to discovery and it had looked exactly like the cage enterprise then maybe we'd be going oh what, what are they doing there but the fact that it looks like a you know visually equal to discovery enterprise i think that sets that sets them up to recast yeah i mean i'm excited i it was an, and again off topic here i shouldn't even be talking about this i should be talking about it on a disco trek only but i was like both like jumping around and like oh my god and then at the same time kind of like side-eyeing enterprise like i loved it i love that we'll, we'll say it's fan service um a lot of people are talking about whether or not we're even going to see any of the crew. I think we'll see the crew, but um, I, I'm, I, I'm more excited than I am skeptical. Nice. So that's, and we're going to get some answers to questions and, and we'll see, but I'm more okay with it than I am not okay with it. So that tells me um, we're good to go. Warp speed. Nice. Nice. All right. So getting back to our fan feedback, um, 
In response to our first episode, a Twitter user TrekFanRick uh, said, Just listened and really enjoyed it. Some great thoughts on the story, and I liked your thoughts on Pike, which had an angle I hadn't considered. Thank you. A great listen while I had to clean my kitchen. Hashtag rock and roll lifestyle. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> All right, also about our first episode, Twitter user Tyrannicus says, Saru's crush on Una was adorable. I loved seeing Burnham and Spock together. I did too. I did too. That whole Indiana Jones scene was was amazing. Wasn't that great? Um, Yeah, and then in response to TNG's Grounded, uh, Sis for Coffee says, Read this recently, quite enjoyed it. There's a role for Spot. (laughs) And finally, regarding drastic measures, Twitter user the John Con says, Dayton is crafty AF. Can't wait to hear your thoughts on the end, plus the post credits scene. Ooh. Ooh. Oh my god, I know all these people. Hi guys, I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I love about this. I mean, I'm only a couple of years into the Trek community and I love how connected everyone is. I just think it's just amazing. You know, while we're on that note, I'm actually really impressed with the way that even other podcast networks are treating us as a new show. Um, Trek fan Rob, I believe is his Twitter handle is um, he does a uh, Trek book club over in the UK and he's just like 100% like wants to see us succeed. So, yep. I, man, even today I, <laughs> I was thinking today and almost tweeted that it's just, it's a, it's a gift to be a part of the Star Trek podcast community. Um, I don't do any non-Star Trek podcasts. I do listen to some non-Star Trek podcasts, but um, I have, uh, it's just such a, such a supportive community and we all look out for each other. And I, again, like we're just so blessed here at Tricorder that oh, this is a our, great network we're so happy that we're on this network well I, uh, that makes my heart happy we uh we were a little little baby network when i came on board and uh we'll be five years old this august um that means we're having a big party right we are we are we will be having a big party and a little intimate dinner for for tricorder family only but um it's just it's it's been amazing you know i sorry for all these tangents guys but please um i had no experience podcasting when i met jeff and i tell the story all the time jeff didn't even think i liked him (laughs) when we met um and then what so that was august so by january he had me on to do a little bitty uh, what are you looking forward to over the holidays um, for the following year? And that's when I proposed the idea for shore leave. And so we started off with the original mission and then shore leave and trek ranks and disco track. And uh, we have drawing track, which is the comics one with Ian and Politrex and reading track. And there may even be more to come. Nice. Mm. Um, it's been amazing to watch our family grow. We just need more women. So, ladies, if you're listening, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. And and we were so honored to have you as our guest for our first feature-length episode. I was just so thrilled when you agreed to do this because you were the person we really wanted to have kick Aww. off the group discussion on this. And I'm going to put him in the hot seat because I've already told him about this. We want Jeff on here. I know how busy he is. I don't know. I know he doesn't have a lot of time to read, but I know there is a Gorn book out there somewhere. You will find a Gorn book. I think you can get the original, the little TOS one, like one shots. I think there's two, two episodes per book and I should know the authors and all that, but there's um, each series. So you could do an arena one. All right. No excuse, Mr. Hewlett. No excuse. I'll light a fire under his butt. (laughs) Perfect. So uh, back to our feedback. Uh, I just want to say great news to John Con and his comments about uh, can't wait to hear the end of our discussion of drastic measures because next time on Reading Trek, we will be continuing our discussion. We are going to cover drastic measures by Dayton Ward, chapters 18 through the ending.
And as always, our upcoming selections can be found on our webpage and on our Twitter at Reading Trek. Before we finish today's podcast, let's let everyone know how they can get a hold of us to continue the conversation. Um, Heather, how can people get a hold of you? So I am LLA Posper on Twitter. So it's L L A P A W S P E R. I'm also at Disco underscore Trek since I mentioned that show and Shore Leave. <laughs> And so I'm one of the admins of the unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas convention Facebook group. So pop on over. There are questions to answer. So just tell us where you found us listening to Reading Trek and we'll let you write in and you will automatically be a part of our Star Trek family. Nice. Marty, how can people get a hold of you? You can find me on Twitter at Time Travel Marty. And uh, you can also find me hanging around the unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas convention group as well. How about you, Will? You can find me there as well. It is a vibrant Trek family, and I am honored to be a part of it. I love chatting with all of you on a daily basis on there. Uh, You can also find me on Twitter at William G. Conlin. And uh, you can visit us online at readingtrek.thetricordertransmissions.com. You can write us with comments, questions, suggestions. Our email address is readingtrekpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at Reading Trek. And if you want to leave a two-minute message with your thoughts for our next show, please call 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-LLAP. Please keep your message to two minutes or less, but we really want to hear what you have to say. And if you like this show, please consider supporting us on Patreon by visiting patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And be sure to check out all the other podcasts on the network, such as the wonderful Disco Trek, Shorely Podcast, Poly Treks, Drawing Trek, and maybe more. And with that, Captain Picard wants us to let him read in peace. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. <laughs>